Good evening, everyone. Uh, you're all very welcome to our final conversation as part of this year's Trinity Law School Spring Series. This evening entitled Time to Get Serious with Professor Blana Clark and Mr. Sean Barton of McCann Fitzgerald. My name is Gareth Crow. I'm an Associate Director with Trinity Development and Alumni or TDA as, as we're known. Tonight's talk will last around 30 minutes uh, followed by 15 minutes of Q&A with you, our viewers. And we should wrap up, wrap up around 7 p.m. Irish time. Uh, we really would encourage you to submit your questions throughout the conversation using the Q&A function on the Zoom panel at the bottom of your screen. We're using Zoom generated automatic subtitles, uh, which you may see now. To turn these subtitles on or off, click the CC closed captions button at the bottom of your screen and click show or hide according to your preference. This webinar is being recorded for later viewing. And if you're watching on Zoom, you will get a link to this recording uh, shortly. The recording will also be available to view on the TCD Alumni YouTube channel. And now I'd like to introduce you to our moderator for this evening, Professor Yvonne Scannell. Professor Scannell is an emeritus professor in the School of Law at Trinity College and is one of Europe's foremost experts on environmental and planning law. She's also a former judge of the European Nuclear Energy Tribunal at the OCED in Paris. Professor Scannell. Good evening, everybody, alumni and friends. And it is wonderful to have this conversation this evening between two of the leading experts in corporate governance and financial law. Lorna Clark, who is from Trinity itself, is the McCann Fitzgerald Chair in Corporate Law and she has a particular interest in corporate governance and financial services sector. She is on the uh, governance board of the OECD, and she's vice president of the Ac academic board of the European Banking Institute. Sean Barton is a partner in McCann Fitzgerald with a specialist interest in administrative and public law. He has a deep understanding of public sector processes and corporate governance and of legal risk management issue, which indeed is very pertinent at present. He acts for many public bodies in judicial review and other legal proceedings, and he practices in the commercial court. So we'll start off with the conversation between Sean and Blonard and ask Blonard, what is this CEAR all about? Well, firstly, uh, thanks Yvonne for, for introducing uh, me and um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here this evening. So um, the SEER is an acronym which stands for the Senior Executive Accountability Regime. And this regime was first mooted in Ireland uh, in 2018 by the Central Bank. And they had just produced a report on behaviour and culture in the Irish retail banks. And you might recall that this uh, followed a serious review that they had uh, undertaken uh, following the tracker mortgage scandal. And they suggested in this uh, report, they found evidence of, of misbehavior and misconduct. And they said that it was really important to improve uh, accountability. And they suggested a new uh, accountability framework. And there were three aspects to this framework. There was um, SEER, which uh, is the focus of this evening's event. Um, they also uh, talked about new conduct standards, which would apply to uh, regulated firms and all employees in those firms. And then they suggested that there would be uh, amendments to the existing fitness and probity regime, which uh, is already in place. Um, and that also uh, aligned with that some improvements in uh, enforcement. And, uh, underpinning that uh, legislation was needed. Um, so the government in, in uh, 2018 uh, agreed that this was necessary and uh, a bill uh, to introduce the statutory underpinnings uh, is uh, due before um, uh, the doll in um, before recess. So perhaps um, before I, I turn to Sean, it, it might be useful just for the audience to uh, to talk about, or just to explain uh, what is, uh, is the purpose of this, what's behind this SEER regime. So the idea is that it will create direct accountability uh, for persons who are performing these, uh, what they call senior executive functions. 
And these will be senior functions in firms um, like a chief executive function or a, 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 an executive on a board or a chief risk officer, those sort of uh, key uh, functions. And the idea is to sort of shift uh, governance responsibilities from the regulator, which is the CBI, uh, onto the shoulders of the banks. And part of this will involve the individuals um, with these senior executive responsibilities signing up to a statement of responsibilities. So this will set out uh, all the prescribed responsibilities and uh, it will uh, undertake uh, to perform these. And uh, that's at an individual level. And then at a, a firm level, the firm will maintain what's called a, a management responsibility map. And basically, this will map out all the governance arrangements and the management arrangements in the entire uh, firm, sort of giving that holistic picture. So it'll set out um, reporting lines, terms of references, how committees feed in. And the idea of this is that when you look at these two documents, um, it should be clear that all the important uh, responsibilities which need to be undertaken in these sort of firms um, are actually being looked after by individuals um, so that the individuals know this, the firm knows this, uh, and equally importantly, the central bank knows this. So when we talk about the, the purpose of, of SEER, um, I think it's probably fair to say that, that it has a number of sort of related purposes. So uh, a lot of the, the media attention on SEER and a lot of the political discussion, um, I think, has, has focused on um, what's seen as a sort of a punitive element uh, of SEER. So every time there is a scandal or a misbehavior is exposed, um, understandably, there are calls for people to be held to account. So we saw this after the banking crisis. Uh, we saw it after the tracker mortgage scandal itself. And, and most recently, perhaps we've seen it in the Davies case. And I sometimes think that, uh, you know, we, we've really been influenced here by, by images uh, from the States, you know, of individuals who are looking contrite and forlorn and they're in their orange jumpsuits and they're being led into a courthouse uh, or led out of a courthouse and, and towards the jail. And I think there's a, a perception in this country that one can uh, evade one's uh, you know, uh, responsibility and get away with it. So I think SEER is going to be important in, in strengthening the accountability of senior executives, um, incentivizing them to behave in a, in a proper way. And also it will strengthen the enforcement powers uh, of the regulators. So the, the, the regulator has enforcement powers. The, the, the central bank has a very strong uh, administrative sanction procedure. It's uh, issued more than um, uh, fines worth more than 128 million. There've been uh, uh, 25 disqualifications uh, and prohibitions. But part of their problem is that to find an individual responsible, um, the first step is, is finding a firm responsible for a, a contravention of the rules and then proving that an individual participated in it. So there was that sort of link between the firm and the individual. And what they're suggesting uh, is that that link uh, be broken and it would make it much easier uh, to impose um, responsibilities um, on individuals. I think the second aspect uh, of their second purpose is, and I think this is actually more important, uh, the first um, purpose I've mentioned focuses on wrongdoing, but the second purpose is, tries to preempt that wrongdoing and um, to catch it at an early stage and, and to prevent it happening. So the idea here is to impress on sort of senior individuals that they have really important responsibilities to set them out very precisely so that they're aware of them. They know what they need to do to comply with it and also know what will happen if they don't comply with it. So that's, you know, really involves sort of internalizing uh, important public policy objectives. And the advantage of that is that it should lead to uh, improved uh, uh, clarity for individuals. Um, so when you come into a firm or as you look around the firm that you're in, it'll be absolutely clear to you who's responsible for, for what. And it should be clear to both the firm and the regulator if there are gaps so if there are important functions that nobody's held their hand up and said, I'll do that, then you know that there's a problem. And I think that links to the, to the last component or the last purpose of, of um, SEER, which is really important. And that's that it be seen as a, a supervisory tool. 
So it's going to fit into uh, the existing fitness and probity regime, but provide um, that granular detail so that when the central bank is doing a fitness and probity uh, assessment, um, it can look to the individual applicant and say, well, these are the responsibilities that they will have. Now I'm better placed to determine whether um, they can actually meet those responsibilities. Do they have that qualification and the experience to do it? Do they have the time? So I, I think it, it provides a, a lot of, of value. So that's, uh, I guess, the, the, um, the perspective of, of the outset. And it's important to say that uh, we're talking at this stage uh, about a proposed regime because it's, it's not in place. But I, I think for that reason, um, I, it's something I've been looking at for a, a couple of years, but I, I think it's important to turn to the expert practitioner uh, and ask, you know, Sean, you know, what is your view of the, uh, the regime? Um, you know, what do you think the general perception is? Is this something that's, that's welcomed or not? Uh, hi, Blonde, and hi, everybody. Um, I suppose the degree of welcome depends on uh, where you're sitting. I think a, a lot of professional advisors are licking their lips at this and saying, look, this is another uh, layer of regulation and another sort of quite sophisticated um, uh, compliance um, uh, requirement for the financial services industry. And, and compliance is probably putting it in too clunky a term uh, precisely because what is being addressed here is culture and ways of behavior. And there's there's an interesting sort of move uh, from, you know, traditional hard law where if uh, an institution or an individual egregiously breaches a regulatory requirement, there's, there's a sanction in the nature of the type of fines that come out after the Minister of Sanctions procedure operated by the central bank, um, or a, a, a criminal conviction and the consequences of that. And, and this is, I think, trying to move the dial into an interesting space, which is around the idea that, you know, ultimately corporates, um, if you treat them separately from the individuals who who run them, uh, are I, I saw it described recently as psychopathic in terms of the um, the social media industry. They have no moral responsibility to customers, um, service users, or anybody else. They they exist to make profit trading on limited liability, um, and unless regulated or unless sort of incentivized to behave morally in certain circumstances, for example, around taking down trolling or abuse in the, in the, in the social media industry, unless there are incentives for them to do that, uh, and those kind of bite at the people who make those decisions, uh, then we're at risk of, uh, you know, what would be regarded as highly immoral behavior by corporates in, in every sector of activity, and that kind of consequences when they take risks which have impacts for consumers and, and economies and so forth. So I think what this is, is, is trying to say is it, it, it's almost uh, <laughs> creating a, 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 a definition of corporations as what they really should be, which is a mix of a body corporate trading on a limited liability and the responsibilities of the people running that business to behave ethically and mor morally and appropriately. And if there are published standards around that business to adhere to them. Uh, and to me, it's, it's kind of moving those who operate in the financial services sector somewhere closer actually to the traditionally regulated professions like solicitors and doctors and more recently nurses and teachers and, and, and other healthcare and social care professionals, which is to say that if you have, you know, if you have a bad experience with, with a business and they cause you a loss, of course, you can have a civil claim against them. But if, if a sort of an individual professional um, uh, out of lack of care um, gives you bad advice or, you know, uh, deals with you in a way that is a, a significant departure from the expected standards of, of professional conduct in that profession, then they are separately liable to be uh, sanctioned or reprimanded by a, a professional regulator. So if you're a doctor or a solicitor or a nurse or a teacher, um, the question of civil liability 
may or may not arise. It, it probably does arise for particularly for doctors and solicitors. But there's also the real risk that if you don't perform to the standards of professional behavior that everybody expects, you're liable ultimately to be struck off, to be excluded from your chosen profession. And having a sort of um, fitness and probity element on entry into these roles kind of to me suggests, look, we're, we're checking people on the way in. And there are many professions where people are checked on the way in as to whether they're fit and proper persons and as to whether th their past behavior might suggest they might be unsuited for, for, for a career in this particular sector. Uh, but with all of the regulated professions, you kind of continue to operate in the profession on the basis that you continue to be able to demonstrate that you meet the standards. And that's true of a, a whole load of other licensed activity. You know, if you, if you run uh, any business which is reg regulated, whether it's a mobile phone company or a um, road haulage company or something like that, there are requirements you have to meet and be able to demonstrate that you meet to the regulator on an ongoing basis. And if you don't, you lose, you're potentially at, at risk of losing your license. And I do think, this proposal will certainly sort of create a focus on the individual within uh, businesses in, in the sector to say, well, actually the buck does stop with me. And uh, I think there's a widespread perception that there's lots of gray areas between the responsibility of the corporate and the responsibility of the individual. And, and very often, if a corporate is responsible for doing something, which was done undoubtedly deliberately or through lack of care, it's astonishing that no individual or indeed no group of individuals within the corporate can be found uh, who, who have some uh, associated level of responsibility. And I think that's, as you were saying, the participation link and derivative liability. Uh, and I think what the central bank is very cleverly doing is moving participants uh, in those industries, the senior executives, more into the kind of regulated profession type of space to say, well, look, there are standards for, for the, the, the jobs you do, and we're expecting that your responsibilities, which are personal to you and for whom you are the person where the buck stops, will be set out clearly so that if there is a, a problem or a crisis, um, we'll be able to go through the documents and navigate through your organization, despite any mm -hmm. obstacles and walls that might be put up in our way to say, ah, we see from the maps that you've created and the responsibility statements that you've created that you, Mr. Bartner, the person responsible for this activity, and we'd now like you to account for how it happened. Uh, and I think the knowledge of that kind of level of personal accountability at the back end if something goes wrong does incentivize people's behavior because if you see somebody on the team not doing the thing quite right it's very easy in the present uh, you know in 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 a more lax culture say well, look i'll let it slide and i don't want to get into confrontation with people but it's it's much more difficult if you're ass is on the line to put it crudely mm. uh, to, 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 and knowing that y your head is on the chopping block to put it less crudely uh, in the event that things go wrong to say I can't let this pass I need to deal with this and that's part of the nuts and bolts of improving culture actually so I think I think it's 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 a very interesting uh, it's a delicate uh, project to engineer but I think conceptually, it's very interesting. And uh, happily, I think there's, as is often the case with, with, with uh, innovations or, 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 or developments in policy here, we as a, as a country often let others road test some ideas first and then maybe uh, jump on board, see what works elsewhere and what doesn't. And that helps us in our thinking in, in constructing something based on those ideas that I think works in our own environment. Yeah, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I'd like to come back in, in a few minutes just to that idea of the, the, the hard law, soft law, because I think that's interesting. That's going to be important here. Um, but I, I think you're, you're right in terms of uh, allowing somebody else to road test it. So we're actually and uh, not uh, underestimating the cleverness of the central bank at, at all. But, you know, this is something that is uh, based on a model which has um, worked uh, successfully uh, in the UK. So this was the, the senior managers regime or senior managers and certification regime in the UK, which was introduced in 2016. 
And like everything else, it was introduced in, in response to a, a scandal that was the, the LIBOR scandal, uh, the audience might remember, uh, in the UK. And they set up a, 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 a parliamentary uh, commission on banking standards and they uh, looked at the evidence and they said that one of the most dismal features of the whole banking industry was the, the striking limitation on the sense of personal responsibility and accountability for leaders. And uh, I think part of the idea of, of the, the, the maps came up in this way, because as you say, um, Sean, people were evading their responsibility. And in particular, the commission found that they were using two uh, particular uh, devices. And the first one was they were uh, using the defense of ignorance. And they were saying, well, I had no idea. I had absolutely no idea that was going on. And, you know, that's that's not my job. And, it, you know, if it was my job, I, I, of course I'd be looking at it. So they created this sort of a, accountability firewall uh, between themselves and the misconduct. And they said this was really deliberate. It was putting on deliberate uh, blindfold so that they they could argue, you know, uh, and there would be no evidence to suggest that they were involved. And I think the the second uh, impediment I, I, found, I always found, and we've seen that actually, I should say, in relation to the ignorance, we've seen it on uh, in many cases playing out in this jurisdiction. But the second one I was intrigued by, uh, they called uh, this uh, the murder of the Orient Express defense. And this involved um, uh, the, uh, the Spoiler alert. saying, if you have a brain. <laughs> exactly. So this involved, uh, you know, the the uh, the manager saying, well, yes, I, I, I was involved. I, I was a big player. You know, I, I was the waiter coming in uh, with the drink rather than the main Agatha Christie character. But the argument was that uh, so many of us were involved. We, we can't hold any one person accountable. And we actually saw that play out. If you look at some of the testimony, the evidence in the banking inquiry, uh, you will see that there are, uh, you know, certain individuals who said um, the the regulator was responsible or the ECB was responsible. And I think, you know, I'm not uh, under, I'm not questioning that in the sense that clearly with the banking crisis, there were a lot of bodies responsible. um, And, you know, there's enough guilt there to, to, to pass around. But that doesn't excuse any one individual from from being involved and and being responsible. So I I think that the idea of of the maps, uh, as you say, Sean, is going to mean that you've got uh, got a name there that you can turn to. Uh, If there is a compliance issue, for example, uh, you don't have to spend all the time investigating, well, whose job was that and that specific. You open a folder and somebody's name um, is there. And, you know, that's that's what they've suggested. Uh, it's it's uh, there are similar processes in place uh, in Australia, um, in Hong Kong, in Singapore. And actually, the Financial Stability Board uh, in 2018 recommended that this was, you know, an absolutely essential part of the tool box uh, to try and, and mitigate uh, misconduct risk. So I think it's important one issue which um, which was uh, controversial uh, in the UK uh, was whether non-executive directors would be brought into the the full glare of the regime, mm. um, and they decided in the end that they wouldn't include non-executive directors in terms of the duty of, of uh, responsibility, the statutory duty there, but uh, they said the only non-executive directors would be involved. Uh, would be particular non-executive directors if they had a role like a chairman or a chair of a key committee. Um, But they accepted um, an argument which was made at the time that if you made all non-executive directors responsible for this, it would be inconsistent with the role they have. Mm. You know, it would encourage them to take on um, different uh, Mm. executive functions and roles and responsibility. And I, I wonder very much, and we don't know, of course, you know, how that's going to play out in this jurisdiction. Um, but, you know, I wonder as a practitioner and, you know, somebody a, a, a advising individuals and firms, how do you think um, this is going to play out in terms of the decision making which goes on within a firm um, and between individuals? How will it affect that sort of dynamic? It, it, it's a very tricky question. And, and, and there's no doubt that... Uh, it, it will, so to speak, 
readjust the balance between the individual and the collective in 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 interesting ways and that may be a good thing um it, 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 it will probably oblige people with whom the box stops according to the map to take considerably greater care about mm. um signing off on things that come up to them and and going through proposals or matters submitted to them for sign off perhaps with with more rigor than might previously have been the case and, and i think that in principle has the capacity to create higher levels of rigor uh, yeah. and you know to the greater tire kicking uh, and 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 looking at all of the potential ramifications of the decision on on all of yeah. the stakeholders in it uh, should improve decision making um I, I, the, the, it's certainly an interesting sort of question about how do you if you're slightly calibrating that balance how do you then sort of fit that into the traditional sort of balance between executive and non-executive and board and executive yeah. uh, and i think it's it's not impossible i mean uh, uh, you know the, the board i suppose at a level of principle is responsible for strategy and the executive executes strategy so so the board in some senses sets out a direction set, sets out what way we're facing what we're going to focus on uh, and and those are generally not are, are very rarely decisions which are capable of giving rise to regulatory infringements. Um, uh, it's it's the execution of the strategy, I think, where 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 breach may may become an issue. I think it certainly seems likely to me that the non-executives, in particular, will have a significant responsibility about cultural aspects of this if 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 it's fully up, I, implemented it 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 will be about supporting um people who get frustrated about saying look my proposals are being over analyzed by my line managers or you know i i feel that they're being mean to me because they're asking me too many questions and it's actually instilling in people that there is a correct balance between rigorous consideration around decision making without being you know without cross examining people in an aggressive way uh, when they're when they're submitting proposals or 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 defending uh, uh, proposed um, uh, decisions and it was ever thus, I think, for the executive, certainly for the senior management team of a, of any business at board level. You know, where's the line between being challenged robustly as a board should, uh, and maybe being kicked around, which which a board shouldn't do? So I think there is there is that sense of you know a, a, a shift in the way of sort of balancing the collective mm. interests and responsibility of the corporate and the individual responsibilities legal and dare one state even moral or ethical responsibilities of the senior managers and to make sure that both are properly supported and i think you know wise non-executives um should find ways of 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 of, of making that happen it's it uh, yeah, and you know cultural change is something which is incremental and can only be repeated and people mm -hmm. learn culture by observing the leaders in an organization so so it must be a sort of ever present thing i was struck actually by by a point you made about the evasion of responsibility and and leadership the you know the it wasn't me uh what i think some people of a younger age called the shaggy defense um it, 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 that, that it's 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 really frustrating i think for stakeholders in a business at a time of crisis where you see people who should be in leadership roles and actually taking ownership of the problem and actively managing it uh often on legal advice and on other professional advice it has to be said distancing themselves from the problem uh, and and walking away from being part of the solution because there is this fear that if they implicate themselves the outcome for them personally will will be worse and and i think you know there's there's again some very delicate calibration which needs to be done in this which does not lead to 
um, worse outcomes for people who are prepared to take responsibility over people who are not. I, 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 and I think it's, it's, it's certainly positive that this sort of closes off the escape hatch for people who want to get out of difficult situations by uh, denying responsibility. Yeah, I, I, I think that's right. And I think, you know, it seems looking at the UK, certainly uh, the way they've done it is they have tried to draw that balance that you're talking about. You know, we, we all know that the, the role of non-executive directors, uh, you know, is supervisory and is oversight. We know that they are um, expected to set values, you know, to, um, to determine purpose and to embed it. Um, and we know, looking at the, the existing Companies Act, you know, the director's duties are individual um, and there is no distinction made between exec and non-exec. It's all in the application. And if you look to see how that's done in the UK in, in terms of this regime, that's exactly uh, what they do in the UK as well. So they say that the senior manager uh, will, be, will be liable for the misconduct if at the time the, uh, of the breach, they didn't take such steps uh, as a person in their position could reasonably be expected to take to avoid it. Um, so originally they talked about a presumption and saying, will you be presumed to, to be responsible? But they changed that um, actually even before the regime came in, um, not surprisingly. Um, but so to, to, to prove in the UK uh, under the act that, that somebody is, is responsible, uh, you have to prove that uh, uh, there are steps that a reasonable person should have taken, should reasonably be expected to take. You then have to prove that they didn't take that. So you had to, to look to see what they actually did and, and match the two up. And then there's, a, there's another hurdle. And that's, you know, um, on top of that, the, the, uh, the regulator, the, the FCA or PRA, whichever it would be, have to uh, prove that in the circumstances, it's appropriate uh, to take action. And that's what the legislation says. Um, and the uh, the guidance, then, and, and this is the, the point uh, I wanted to, to come back to about hard law, soft law, because it's in the guidance that the FCA sets out, well, look, these are the steps that you know, we think you, you should have addressed. These are the things that we would look to in seeing what's reasonable. And one of the, the first thing they mention in the in the guidance handbook is uh, we look to see your your role and your responsibility, and um, we accept that a, a non-executive director could reasonably be expected to take on uh, a different role. So we will look at that. Um, another thing they said they would look at is, uh, which is is interesting from a from a corporate law perspective, especially as an academic, they they said they would look at. Uh, how your behavior uh, fitted in with uh, with your legal obligations. So, for example, your, your duty under the Companies Act um, and, and also your, your duty under various corporate governance codes. Um, and they'll uh, they'll look to see, well, you know, when you took this job, uh, you know, as you said, you know, did you kick the tires? So did you look to see what staff were working in the area that you're responsible for? Are they qualified? What sort of policies have they um, you know, to, to, to provide controls. So the, there's a huge difference really in there between um, soft law and, and, and hard law. And so I, I wonder if that's, that's, that's two different types of law, but I, I wonder within the, the existing areas of law, which apply at the moment, do you see this um, as, as something that would um, complement uh, existing uh, laws, or, or is it something that's going to be uncomfortable with it, like in terms of, say, uh, employment rights, or, you know, how, how do you see that panning out? I, I think uh, a lot will depend on the sort of choices the regulator makes, uh, because, uh, you know, how do these things pan out? A crisis or a uh, 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 scandal happens there is a focus on the organization uh, part of that focus is undoubtedly on individuals within the organization there are suddenly a whole load of 
competing risks and competing incentives. I suppose the the the, the organization, as I said, that the, the the psychopathic corporation mm. is its interest is in self preservation. So uh, very often in these situations, it's like, okay, who who is who's going under the bus here? Who's taking taking one for the team? Who's who's who are we pushing out to the front in case there is a, a need for somebody to wear orange today? Um, and that choice is is often. A, a, a purely pragmatic commercial choice and not necessarily one which the regulator or a court would say necessarily sits comfortably with an analysis of the relative responsibilities but that's the way that's the way corporations behave their 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 first uh, duty is to is is to preserve themselves um so you have the corporation looking at a potential uh, administrative penalty or, or or potentially criminal exposure um you have individuals who may be exposed to something like this mm. which we might call a sort of analogous to a professional disciplinary hearing at the same time you may have um the corporation a, a, running a disciplinary investigation because of course mm. one of the things you say uh, as soon as a scandal erupts is to say oh well we've got some people in to investigate we'll find out what went wrong which is the the, the first thing you do of course is to create a, an investigation or a review so you can buy time and you can mm. maybe stop external um agencies such as the regulator coming in and doing it for you um and I, I suppose that in, in some instances, actually, it, it seems to me likely that the regulator will accept uh, what the uh, corporation produces as the fruits of this. If the corporation says, look, this was really a collective thing and we couldn't find any individual who uh, grievously sinned and unfortunately it was just a cultural want across the board, there may be cases where the regulator will accept this. And similarly, there may be cases where there clearly is a rotten apple or two rotten apples or a rotten unit. And, and if that's identified and uh, there might well be disciplinary action taken by the corporation, the regulator might a a a mm -hmm. assess the relative responsibilities on its own part and say, actually, that feels right to us. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and whether or not the, the the regulator then takes steps on foot of something like the accountability regime if the the people responsible for the harm have been removed from the the, the business and in all probability unlikely to be back in the industry very quickly you yeah. know i i think there might be a judgment as to say well do we need to sort of uh, pursue that line um necessarily um but but certainly it seems to me it's never going to be the case that if there's an investigation of suspected contraventions involving uh, a, a regulated entity uh, it, it doesn't at all seem to me likely that the regulator would always be running a senior executive ac uh, accountability investigation in parallel there will be some cases where that will be appropriate and in almost every investigation it may well be that the regulator will say well show me the you know the decision maps and the responsibility yeah. maps so that we can get a fix on who we need to speak to as witnesses in this and and who appears to have the responsibility and we can at least get their account of matters which this accountability regime is supposed to give us and that might be the end of that piece it might never move yeah. on to 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 adverse action against the individuals because you know all of these things will raise a whole load of interesting legal questions around you know uh, uh double jeopardy type arguments that if 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 i'm in the firing line in a disciplinary uh situation on foot of an investigation i'm also in the firing line on foot of regulatory uh piece um are my rights of the defense somehow prejudiced and there'll be there'll be a lot of arguments around around those sorts of things but i think in some cases if the regulator feels that the corporation is actually playing with a straight bat in terms of accounting for who was responsible for what i think they'll give them a degree of rope uh, if the regulator forms the view that the corporation is making some people scapegoats because it's convenient 
and because it's the cheapest option uh, mm. for 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 the corporate to you know um, basically fire these people and and hand them a chunk of money for doing so. I think mm. the regulator will 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 n- not be mollified by that if the regulator feels th- the people being ostensibly mm-hmm. made personally responsible by the corporate are quite different from the people who under our analysis should be accountable for what happened if if there's if there's if people are being made scapegoats as part of a, a, an internal company process for the companies for the corporation's own convenience and 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 for pragmatic reasons i i think the regulator will be will be very likely to challenge that actually and yeah. so therefore i i think there are some cases where this regime will slot in with all of the other um, uh, tools available to the regulator. And there are some cases where it will be, you know, of incidental relevance, it will be a way to assist them to, to, to get evidence, but it won't necessarily lead to, 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 to action following on from it. Yeah, I mean, it strikes me as I'm listening to you that, you know, it is going to involve uh, trusting the regulator, you know, to to act appropriately and and proportionately uh, and fairly. Um, You know, it it also, uh, you know, two other points just from listening to you. uh, One is that, you know, a question that lawyers are going to be asked increasingly is, do I need do I need my own lawyer? And, Mm -hmm. And I think they're going to be asked that really early and it's going to be a really difficult one to answer. And then the third point that strikes me is just, you know, you mentioned the idea of, of um, ensuring that individuals don't come back into the industry. Mm. And this is an issue which is, it, you know, it's called the rolling bad apple mm. uh, idea. And it's that, you know, somebody who's been found guilty of misconduct, you know, it turns up, you know, loses their job in, in one entity and then turns up in another one. Mm. And, uh, you know, part, you know, and there, there are lots of issues with that, you know, the, you know, in theory, they're not supposed to be bad apples, just bad barrels, yeah. uh, you know, also, you know, sometimes people, you know, want that. And it, it goes back to your earlier point about, you know, sometimes there are people with strong personalities and, mm. you know, virtue on, you know, psych- psychopathic as, as mm. Lynn Stout used to say as well. Mm. And, you know so one of the suggestions that they use in the UK is you have to have a a regulatory reference so it means before you get um, you hire somebody for these uh, senior jobs uh, you have to get a reference from all their employers in the last six years Mm -hmm. and they have an obligation to tell you uh, everything about any disciplinary event and uh, offenses uh, any misbehavior, any blots on the copybook, and it overrides NDAs. It's you know mm. this this is this is a key issue, um, and you know perhaps if we have time in the Q and A, we we might discuss how that might work. Mm. Um, you know, I I think that's back to soft law. I think there's mm. a, a role for an entity like the uh, Irish Banking Culture Board mm. uh, in in looking at that. But I am conscious of time and um, uh, just allowing for, for Q&A. So, uh, Yvonne, I'm going to turn it back to you uh, to, to, to uh, see if you have any questions for us. Thank you, Donald. That was very interesting. I was just wondering, as you were talking through this, I have lots of questions, but one of them is that when they investigated the right report and so on, the faults that happened to, during the Celtic Tiger, one of the main issues was the, the position with the regulator who was in fact um, lacking in expertise and so on. And does this system provide for any accountability on the behalf of the professionals working with the regulator? Um, not, not, in this, not in this particular um, system. This, this is for regulated uh, entities. Um, and uh, this this doesn't deal with with that issue in particular. Um, you know, I, I would say that you know since the banking crisis, there has been a, a, a total uh, structural change in the regulator uh, here. Um, you know, in 2010, we had a, a new act, a new commission, a new governance structures, uh, new forms of regulation, new oversight. Uh, you know, from uh, from Europe, um, a whole different. Uh, set of, of individuals and a whole different culture uh, in the central bank. Um, so, uh, 
So speaking from from the domestic, I I think that is quite different, but it's just it's not something that's it's outside the scope of this particular uh, regime. Okay, and Sean, I just here are some questions. Mm. One person wants to know: in large organisations, how are they going to know where the buck stops? Well, it, it, as I understand it, part of the proposal, and and it's not a it's not a complete answer, but it at least it's part of the answer. Part of the proposal is a kind of responsibility map. So, in effect, the regulator can see the job specification, to put it crudely, uh, or the responsibility statement of each of the senior executives. So, you know, if 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 I'm uh, head of chief risk officer. There's a listing of the decisions that have to come through me or that I have to sign off on. So uh, even though that might be regarded in some respects as maybe a bit formulaic, at, at least it creates an evidence trail where the regulator can at least go to somebody and challenge somebody and say, well, hang on. It says in your responsibility statement that you have to sign off on this. Um, now, and I think all you can do is to kind of say, well, look, this has to happen at a senior level. And if you go to the person concerned and they explain, well, you know, of the 200 people ultimately reporting to me, there were two or three who got it wrong and either I've dealt with them or I haven't been able to find them. I think at that level, then it's a question for the regulator how deep they want to drill down or do they do they accept that explanation that, that the faults arose from you know lack of experience let's say at, at at a junior level but i think what this regime at least gives the potential to do is it brings the regulator to the right person to be able to ask those questions to be able to to drill deeper rather than facing what bonnet was describing earlier as the firewall where you know everybody's kind of behind the wall saying oh no that was nothing to do with me i think it it, it creates a uh, 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 an evidence pathway, I guess, into 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 accountability. It's not. It's it, it, it's never going to be complete, but at least it 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 allows the regulator to get further in if 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 they need to. Yeah, right. Uh, so obviously, there's internal allocations of responsibilities yeah. which can be traced. The next question deals with uh, penalties. Really, they're saying that uh, an individual can be fired and sent off with a big pension. But shouldn't the institution be penalised in some way? And they gave an example of um, uh, removing the authority of the guilty institution to advertise for a while after an offence. What do you yeah, think about that? I mean, uh, uh, do you want to come in on that, Lana, or will, will I um, share my thoughts? Uh, well, you go ahead, and, and then I'll, I'll, I'll follow in. So, sorry, I, well, I, I was going to say on that, I mean, I suppose the danger is always with with penalizing uh, uh, corporations is what is the consequence for the business owners the shareholders often who who may often be innocent now if if the business owners are the same as the guilty parties maybe a, a different view might be justified but if you have a you know a plc type business um if you if you cut too deep, you simply kill the business, and you know the the the, the innocent owners may be may be um, uh, left left holding the baby. Now that one might say, in fact, is the logical consequence of introducing a level of 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 um, you know uh, moral compulsion, I suppose, into the system. In that, if you're the owner, you are the shareholders, and it, through your power in general meeting, you should be able to establish uh, th that a premium is based on proper culture and so forth. But I, I, I think the shareholder power in those cases is 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 relatively is relatively light. And I I, I do agree that there is a perception that for the convenience and for the su survival of the corporation people who may or may not be guilty are often paid off and that sort of allows the corporation to say we've dealt with it we've moved on open for business again lets everybody forget about that i i i think the regulator will now have a capacity to say well we don't accept that allocation of responsibility and um you know to 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 question uh whether 
uh, people who continue within the organization have properly accounted for, 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 for their involvement in things. And that's going to be a real headache, I think, for, 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 for corporations who just want to get a quick and dirty solution, however you know, messy that might be and move on. Mm. Well, what um, do you I, think about that, knowledge? Yeah, yeah I, I mean, just, just looking at the question, I, I think, you know, there, there are a couple of issues. I, I mean, one, the idea of, of uh, the penalties they can impose. So, I mean, they're quite extensive penalties in terms of fines and sanctions in the UK, at least. Um, you know, and they, they stretch, you know, really unlimited fines and disqualification. There's also the huge reputational damage, uh, you know, of, uh, of a finding against you in a case like this. Um, and as we as we were discussing earlier, there's the possibility that you can't get back in uh, mm -hmm. if you, you know, because you have a black mark and uh, your the, the mandatory reference now indicates this. Uh, you can't hide behind a, a, a non-DA the way you might have done before with a settlement agreement. And, you know, I, I think uh, anyone, you know, anyone in this, uh, anyone in the audience who's ever sat on an interview board, you know, where you've seen a reference and it's a glowing reference. And, and sometimes it's a reference which has, has very little information in it. Um, and, uh, you know, you're aware that there's very little information because, you know, the, the employer doesn't want to get sued telling you, you know, what they really think. Um, but this is going to, you know, uh, uh, supersede that. And it's going to mean that if there is a black mark, you will not be able to, to, to work in the industry again. Um, I, it, it, I, I agree completely with Sean. It, it remains to be seen what the effect on the... Uh, on the firm is and that says that's sort of a whole different area that's market discipline and we've seen instances before where the market hasn't disciplined uh, you know entities which have uh, engaged in misconduct uh, you know whether it's breach of ESG or uh, you know involvement in, in, in various scandals you know that's the way the market works so I, I'd be more confident in this regime than I would be in the market. Okay, uh, Blonde, next question, Blonde, you can take this one. What do you consider the main challenges to SEER from Irish constitutional law perspective? Um, I'm, I, I, first of all, would, would caveat this by saying we're not a constitutional law expert and, you know, uh, but I, I can see that there, there are obvious uh, implications uh, and, and issues for this. So even staying with the issue we've just been discussing, the, the, the reference, um, you know, everyone has a right to a good name. Everyone has a right to fair procedure, uh, you know, the, the right to, to know the case that has been made against them uh, and the right to, to respond to it. That's a very, very basic constitutional principle. How will that play out if we have these references? Um, so... Uh, in the UK, for example, in certain cases, if there's a disciplinary action and you leave the firm before it's, um, it's, it's, uh, it's completed, um, that may still uh, turn up on your, uh, on your reference um, and you may not have an opportunity to, uh, to provide an input into that reference. Um, so that's an issue, and that's going to be a huge concern, um, not just a constitutional issue, but I suspect, you know, there are GDPR issues there. Um, there are issues, you know, tort, lawyer, tort lawyers will, will have a, a field day with, with this, I suspect, in terms of defamation, um, you know, interference, uh, tortious interference. Um, I, I, you know, there are challenges. There are absolutely serious challenges. Um, but uh, they have been overcome to an extent uh, in the UK, although clearly there is, there's, there's not a written constitution there, but I think they are surmountable, but there are challenges. And partly, I suspect that's why it's taken so long for this bill uh, to emerge, um, because it's going to be challenged. Uh, you know, the minister uh, has said that, and he's, he's correct, it is going to be challenged. So it just has to be robust. Next question, I, this for you, Sean, I think mm. is there already in existence in the relevant legislation, a list of situations where a senior person mm. is put under inquiry and would be liable if he should, she didn't do so? If not, could such a duty be introduced 
and would it help to do so? I have to say, I don't understand that question. Do you understand? I, I, yeah, I, I mean, I suppose it comes back to this, this, this sort of, you know, um, I didn't know defence. And um, when Blonet was speaking earlier about the, 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 the approach taken in the UK about saying, what would a reasonable person have done? And can you demonstrate uh, that you took the steps as, as, as an accountable senior manager? Uh, that a reasonable person would have taken in those circumstances. Um, it, it, it sort of chimed with me that one of the things that came in recently that, that's in the same space is Section 18 of the, I can't remember, it's the 2018 Criminal Justice Act, but the, the Bribery and Corruption um, Act, where um, this failure to prevent uh, offence uh, may kind of um, visit uh, bodies corporate, where bribery occurs within them if the board or the senior management team failed to take reasonable steps to prevent uh, cor corruption arising. So I, I, I think there's kind of a, uh, again, I, 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 I think as Blana described it, uh, what the regime is, is, is aimed at doing is slightly making this less of a statutory list of, of duties of senior managers and actually pushing the responsibility back onto the businesses themselves, the regulated businesses, because they know their own business the best. They know how they're set up. They know what, what their unique structure of senior management team is. So they're the people who are best positioned to say, well, the director of you know, HR is responsible for people, or the director of this is responsible for this, and the director of that is responsible for that. So, so it, it, it gives them a lot of, uh, I think, leeway to define responsibilities for themselves, uh, uh, because I, I, you know, in in, in a way, I, I think that necessarily has to be the case. Because if you have a statutory list saying the chief risk officer in any financial services company over 250 people has to be responsible for the following things, well, you get movement around within organisations and movement of functions, and people come and people go, and sometimes you get a better person. Who, who can control two functions. And it's really up to the, 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 the board to decide, you know, what responsibilities fall within what unit or department. So, so, so I, 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 I definitely get the sense that um, while you could set up a statutory list of, of responsibilities of particular positions, um, that uh, the idea is to create a lot of uh, empowerment on the part of the individual businesses to, to, to draw these up themselves and by being given the authority to draw them up yourselves they're also being given the responsibility of ensuring that's properly managed and performed because it's up to the board ultimately to supervise that those those responsibilities set out in every individual's responsibility statement are actually are actually ultimately performed so it's easy for the regulator then to say well look you've you know if something goes wrong i won't say you've you've you you've you've you you've written your own charges but you've you you if you've signed a, a responsibility statement saying i am responsible for that within the organization it's it's very hard to duck out of it when the when the regulator comes calling i think and can I just add, can I just add to that, Yvonne, just by saying that uh, agreeing completely, and it, it's interesting, there was a, a review by the FCA in, in 2019 of the regime in the UK, and exactly as the questionnaire, as the questioner had said, um, a number of, of um, firms said, tell us what good looks like, give us the definitive yeah. list, we want to know what it's like. And the FCA's response was exactly uh, what Sean said. You know, they said, you know, it's not in your interest, uh, you know, to, to do this. This is supposed to shift behavior. It, it's, it's up to you to define it. So we'll give you guidance, but it's in everybody's interest that this guidance uh, is just that. It's, it's principles uh, and you apply it in different ways and you rely on, I think, market um, bodies, um, you know, to, to assist in the interpretation. But all that has to be soft law, not hard law. And just to add one very brief sort of additional comment on it, on it, which is that if and when this comes in, I'm always a fan of carrot before stick, so that the yes. idea of kind of sanctions being imposed to people should be kicked off a number of uh, months or years down the road, and there needs to be a strong exercise 
with all the industry stakeholders and trade associations and what have you to say to people this involves cultural change involves looking at how your organization works and who the people are who kind of control the levers of power in it and to understand that carefully and to to, to change those cultures and it shouldn't be about scalps uh, early on it should be about supporting that positive change and you know getting stakeholders in the industry to help people write up precisely those kinds of maps and and statements and 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 what good looks like and 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 helping people to to roll it out and embed culture and 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 really the the, the negative parts of it the negative sanctions for people sh- should should only be certainly early on in very extreme cases and uh, you know um and and probably not in the first rollout of the of, of of the process. I think positive first, and then the the, the regulation might bear its teeth and wave its big stick at, at a much later stage. Do you think, Sean, there would be a sort of a professionalization, as it were, of the regulated industry, so that they have the equivalent of the teachers' council or whatever? Mm. I, I think that's that's quite possible. I mean, I know, say, within banking, obviously, a lot of people are members of the Institute of Banking uh, mm-hmm. anyway, and they do obviously great work on on standards and CPD and all of those kind of things. So there's a, a sort of voluntary move from parts of the sector uh, in, in that direction. Uh, but, but but I think it, it feels like that. I mean, it feels like because you've got the, um, the, 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 prescribed control functions and fit and proper person on the way in that it feels like people are working in an environment uh, if you're a senior executive in the financial services sector where you could be expected to account for compliance with the standards expected of a reasonable professional in your sort of position at any time by, by a regulator much as a doctor or a solicitor or a nurse or a teacher might expect to have to do now on foot of a complaint. So, 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 so I think that's mm-hmm. precisely it. It's almost a, 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 a regulatory sort of, um, I don't know what you call the tide coming in into the space of the professionalization of, of okay. certain roles in the, in the financial services industry. And, mm-hmm. and that's not inappropriate, I suppose, given that professionals are regulated because the advice they give or the things they do on behalf of customers or clients may have such profound impacts on the person's well-being or financial situation or legal situation that a, 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 a very enhanced duty of care is, 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 is almost imposed on that you know, professional to client uh, relationship. And that's probably appropriate in some respects in, in at least part of parts of the financial services industry. Okay. We're running out of time now, so I'm going to ask the questions with yes or no answers, really. Brown, Brown, uh, Brown, do you think a senior, exe- senior legal roles in firms will be captured by SEER? Senior legal roles? Uh, yeah. I wouldn't have thought so. I would have thought that that would fall outside uh, the scope. Uh, I, I think, it, oh, yes. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you don't think so? No. Uh, somebody else wants, um, Sean, you can answer this one. Surely the Ministers and Secretaries Act must be repealed. This is the ultimate evasion of responsibility. I think we no know comment. That's just a comment, isn't it, Ray? Yeah, and I mean, it's, 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 yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, 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 it might be interesting to bring the same sort of thinking as, as, as applies in SEER into the public service, but that's, mm. that's a whole other day's work, I think. Yes, I think hell will freeze over first. And Indeed. here, then this one, what is the standard of proof for finding accountable persons guilty? Is there a business judgment rule? Well, I think the business judgment rule is incorporated into that standard of, of reasonable as we we're talking about. Um, so certainly uh, it, there, there will be no misconduct if you acted in a way that was reasonable and uh, particularly if it's evidenced. And that's really important. Mm. It's going to, to, to lead to changes in people demonstrating that they have acted uh, reasonably in the circumstances. Mm. Right. And, and I think there'll be a lot of... T- 
comparison to cases in professional regulation, you know, medical council decisions and so far, what's, what's the accepted standard of proof for a disciplinary committee there? And there's, there's been a lot of law on that over and back over the years as to whether it's beyond reasonable doubt or somewhere close to it. OK, well, there's one other question then. There's one which we've answered already in the constitutional law issue. Mm. And the final question is, what do you think the impact of SEER will have on CP86 designated person roles? Will it, will it undermine the importance of those functions or will it overlap and increase its importance? Um, I, I mean, I, I, I think it's viewed as uh, something which is going to complement the existing uh, regimes. Obviously, some of the, the, uh, the, the roles of the, the designated um, persons um, may fall within, or some of the people holding those designated roles may fall within uh, the, uh, the, uh, the scope uh, of SEER. Uh, and in, in such a case, uh, I can see it as um, strengthening um, the, uh, the accountability. Uh, I think it's generally something that would be welcomed uh, by, uh, by uh, firms uh, in the UK. It didn't, it didn't apply to investment firms in the first tranche. They were just brought in uh, in a later tranche. But um, speaking to certainly some of the uh, some individuals involved in investment fund managers uh, management quite recently, this was something that was welcomed, um, you know, the, the, the CEO regime. Thank you very much, Blonard, and thank you very much, Sean. It was very interesting this evening, and thank you all to our alumni. Garrett? Thank, thank you all. Uh, particularly uh, thanks to, to Sean Barton from McCann Fitzgerald for joining us this evening and giving uh, of your time to generosity. Much appreciated. Also to Professor uh, Blonard Clark, our McCann Fitzgerald Chair of Corporate Law at Trinity College. Thank you also. And I must also particularly thank Professor Vaughan Scannell, who's been with us for every night every Tuesday evening for the last four weeks. Uh, the spring series has concluded. I really do thank you all, our alumni, for joining us uh, this evening. I, I, I can't give a firm commitment, but I, I'm confident we may be back in the autumn time um, for another series of lectures and, and conversations. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you again soon. Good evening.